Nature isn't just out there in some far off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi everyone, today we are talking to Rebecca Nessel, who recently completed her master's degree at the University of Florida. Hi, Rebecca. Welcome to Backyard Ecology. Thank you for talking with us today. Hi, yes, and thank you for having me. Oh, yes, and I am so excited to be talking to you, and I'm looking forward to this conversation because more and more people are wanting to plant milkweeds in their gardens to help monarchs. But despite that, we're really just starting to conduct research on those garden settings. Most of the research has been always been done out in those wilder areas, the more rural areas, more pristine areas, things like that. Not so much in garden settings around homes, but that's starting to change some. And some of your recent research adds to that data and is part of that growing research on milkweeds and urban settings. But before we really get into that, let's talk for just a few minutes and tell everyone a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, of course. So like you said, I went to the University of Florida and completed my master's. I did that with Adam Dale, and he is the urban entomologist. So that was my primary focus. And I personally just, I'm from Florida, and I have always been in the outdoors, have always loved just getting my hands dirty. So of course, I chose a degree in entomology <laughs> where I could get my hands very dirty and from there, I wanted to connect conservation with urban ecology. So that's how I got interested in this monarch conservation in urban areas. And I'm sure many of our listeners are familiar with the general guidelines that if you want to have monarchs, you need to plant milkweeds for monarchs. And until recently, that was really about all you ever heard about when discussing planting for monarchs. So it was milkweeds, 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 milkweeds. And milkweeds are important because that's the only thing that the monarch caterpillars can eat. But milkweeds aren't the whole story because the monarch butterflies, the adults, they're active for a lot longer than milkweeds are blooming. So they have to be able to utilize other nectar sources. And they do, they utilize a whole lot of nectar sources. And that's where your research comes in. So can you tell us just a little bit about your research? So you're right, monarchs do need more than just milkweed to feed on. And what's interesting is actually the milkweed flower is more attractive to bees and wasps than butterflies. Monarchs certainly do utilize it and so do other butterflies, but the flower shape is highly attractive to those bees and wasps. So monarchs feed on a diversity of flowers and for their nectar source to keep up their energy for their migration and refuel essentially. So yeah, the nectar sources were a big part of my research and that's what I started thinking about when my grad advisor and I came up with this project was okay, uh, we know that they need milkweed for their caterpillars to feed on, but that's not it. That's not the whole picture. So I started digging into some of the literature and trying to figure out what other people had done first. And there are very little studies actually, surprisingly, um, mm -hmm. very little to back up any of the uh, recommendations on Monarch Gardens. So that was our huge question, was what happens when you mix milkweed with other plants? Are they more attracted to these gardens or are they not? And when you think about it, most urban gardens don't have just milkweed. You're not going to just plant a bunch of milkweed, especially because you're going to likely going to get butterflies that lay their eggs in this milkweed and there goes your beautiful plant. It's completely eaten by caterpillars. <laughs> so you probably want something else there to aesthetically please you. <laughs> right. I mean, and that's something that I talk about a lot when I'm talking to people about planting for gardens is that what we do around our homes is one thing. What we do out 
in conservation areas where we're trying to preserve or conserve those larger planting areas is different because they are our homes, because it is our garden areas, we've got to come up with a balance that works well for the wildlife and the pollinators that we're trying to attract, but also works for our lives as well. And so you do want to have that balance of maybe not having all of your plants eaten at the same time. I mean, I have no problem having my plants eaten, but I like to have some other things that aren't eaten then. Exactly. Yes. And that's, that's a lot of what I think of. And I, I love plants. I love gardening. And, you know, so some of my personal thoughts come into this when I created my project and, you know, you're right. You're absolutely right. Our gardens are not natural areas. They're completely different. They're disturbed. They're typically compacted because you had heavy equipment come in to build your house. So it's not the same. Uh, it's a completely different environment. So creating a conservation habitat in an urban garden, you have to think differently. You can't think the same. So that's kind of what we did and what others who have done this similar research are thinking about, okay, how do we create this garden that is aesthetically pleasing to homeowners and also is attractive to our, our monarchs or other insects or uh, wildlife in general um, for conservation purposes? So we had kind of two different thoughts of this. Um, we originally actually were thinking of this for golf courses because golf courses have these huge out of play areas mm -hmm. and they have excess nitrogen uh, because they want to keep their turf grass looking green and aesthetically pleasing to golfers. So there's this huge area that's out of play and we're like, okay, we can use this as a way to create a project around. And that's kind of how it started. And then it went in a completely <laughs> just like broader <laughs> direction by being like, okay, let's expand this just to urban areas in general. Yeah, that's really interesting that expanding it out and being able to do it more than just at, with the golf courses, but also something that we can apply in our own homes as well. So with your research, you were using specifically swamp milkweed, correct? correct? Or rose milkweed? Yes. And how were your gardens set up? I mean, as far as were the plants touching each other or were they spaced out more? Were they on the perimeter or kind of mixed in as you did that? Because in one of my early episodes, I chatted with Adam Baker, who did some research out of University of Kentucky on some of those suburban and urban garden settings up near Lexington area. And so I'm kind of thinking about how his work and your work ties in or does it? So that's a great question. And I'm so glad you brought up Adam Baker because his research papers, a couple of them, and especially his habitat design is actually where we kind of went with our habitat design. So in his, some of his research, he talks about how um, habitat design matters for monarchs to lay eggs. It, it's the plant apparency basically. So what's more apparent for monarch butterflies is it milkweed that is in the center of a patch surrounded by other tall species. Can they easily find that or not? And he basically concludes that milkweed needs to be more obvious. And so that's kind of where we went. So since we had four other species in addition to swamp milkweed, for our mixed species treatment. We had some that were tall and some that were short. So we wanted to make sure that each species, not just milkweed, was going to be planted in a way that wasn't going to be lost by the other species. So our garden design was we um, started north to south, that's how we planted, and our tallest species were in the north part of the plot. And then it, it descended in height. And I'm assuming, since you had looked at Adam's work previously, were the plants grow so they were touching each other or were they more spread out? They were spaced based on um, the spacing uh, suggestions for each species, actually. And all the species we selected are commercially available. So they have a lot of information that you can find. All of them are native. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, they were spaced. They weren't typically touching other species. 
in their own row, they sometimes did touch each, the same species touched each other, but they didn't typically touch other species because of our spacing. Okay. Definitely more the formal garden style versus wild and crazy out natural look. Yes, definitely. Okay. And so what kind of results did you find in those garden settings? So for the garden settings, we found some surprising results because based on any hypothesis that with herbivores in specific, which the monarch is an herbivore through the caterpillar stage, you would think that a monoculture would be more attractive. So a bunch of milkweed planted together with nothing else, Mm -hmm. just because they should also be more apparent because there's right. this dense population of milkweed saying, hello, here I am. You know? <laughs> right, <laughs> so exactly. Calling to the monarchs. So um, that's kind of what we predicted would, would happen when we were first thinking about this. But then we started thinking about, okay, but we're also, the species that we selected that were not milkweed were specifically selected because they are butterfly nectar resources. So it was kind of this weird prediction we couldn't decide at first okay what what's going what do we think is going to happen and and we did find a little bit of surprising results based on other herbivore research so we found that we had more eggs laid per our um, our focal milkweed plants Um, we only surveyed six plants out of the plots just to keep it consistent so we didn't survey all of the milkweed and the milkweed monoculture plot we only selected six and same thing, our mixed species, there were only six uh, milkweed plants. So those were the ones that we uh, randomly monitored. So we found that there were more eggs laid in our mixed species plots on these milkweeds than in the monoculture plot. That was really surprising to us. (laughs) Yeah, it is. And I guess one question would be, and I don't know if this is something that can even be answered really, is do we know if it was more of a dilution effect with having all those milkweeds and the monocultures that you had possibly more eggs overall just spread? We don't, we can't answer that, unfortunately. And you're right, it could be a dilution effect. It could be the monarchs had more resources and they just they've laid them on other plants um, Mm -hmm. instead of concentrating them on those six. Um, That's very, very possible. And we can't answer that, unfortunately. Hopefully somebody else continues this type of research and will answer that, but yeah. And that's part of science is that we're always building on what somebody else did. No project can answer everything with it. Exactly, yeah. And my, my excitement with it was though that they were still laying eggs and laying more eggs on these these six focal species in a mixed plot. So to us, that suggests that they are going to find your milkweed when it's in a garden with other species and they might do better, just the adults themselves. We can't say for sure, but with the uh, additional species that are blooming, there's more refueling for the adults. Right, and that makes sense and it is, very exciting and promising results, especially for backyard gardeners and people in urban and suburban areas who don't have tens of acres or hundreds of acres to plant. And so in that situation, you don't want to, as we've already discussed, plant nothing but milkweeds. I mean, if for no other reason than you want something blooming at a different time of the year, I mean, just one little garden patch of nothing but milkweeds is going to get pretty boring. One little garden patch of nothing of anything is going to get boring. We want that diversity. So being able to have that diverse garden area, is nice. Yeah. And that's, that's something else I forgot to mention was we, I should, I guess I should talk about more about the plant selection too, was we thought about this in, you know, how some gardeners might think, which is you do want that continuous bloom because you want it to be aesthetically pleasing. And also for conservation reasons, a continuous bloom is better. So we did, we selected species based on when they would bloom. uh, And we chose different bloom period flowers. So we had a continuous flowering, blooming period essentially 
from the beginning of our experiment, which was beginning of April all the way through October. We had continuous bloom in our mixed species plots because of that. Whereas in the monoculture plot, they didn't really start blooming until mid to late July. And then they stopped end of September. And just from a conservation standpoint, having those mixed gardens is going to benefit so many more species than just a single standard milkweed. I mean, lots of species use milkweeds, but having that diversity is going to benefit a whole lot more. Yes, and I, I saw, uh, unfortunately, we did not actively collect data on that, but I, every time I was in these plots collecting data on the eggs, I saw so many different insects out there. I mean, talk about diversity. There were jumping spiders like in our flowers and there were wasps, bees, beetles, just everything you can think of visiting these plots. And it was just so cool to see the activity. It, and the milkweed flowers are very attractive to insects as well. So if you are able to get your milkweed to bloom, if your caterpillars don't eat it all, you're going to get increased diversity with that as well. But yeah, it was, it was really cool to see. And we did set out some sticky traps to try to get an idea of what was visiting. Definitely didn't capture everything that I was seeing, but the mixed species plots did support a higher, we call them natural enemies, which are essentially predators and parasitoids lumped together. We saw more natural enemies in these mixed species plots than in the monoculture plots too. So they're definitely supporting more than just monarchs. Right. And we don't want people to get the wrong idea that these mixed species gardens are bad because we have more predators. It's all part of the ecosystem. It all works together. Um, and you had some really surprising results there too, I know. Yes. <laughs> um, how does that translate to the monarchs themselves, because you could easily say, oh no, there's more predators. Is this a bad thing? Yeah, that's a great question. And so many people worry about that, um, especially with monarchs and other butterflies of conservation concern. Um, we always get these questions. And so we did actually look at that as well, because that was one of our questions. If we have more of these natural enemies, is that bad? So we set up these biological control cages to test if we did get more control of monarchs in the mixed species plots versus the monoculture, because you would, based on previous research, it shows that natural enemies are more attracted to diverse mixtures mm -hmm. of flowers than monocultures. So you would think there would be more control of monarchs. Um, however, we did not find that. We actually found no difference between our milkweed monoculture plots versus our mixed species plots. So that was really cool finding, especially since we found more natural enemies in these plots. So despite there being more potential predators, those natural enemies, and when I say potential predators in this case, I, I'm including the parasitoids in there as well as the actual predators themselves. But even though their numbers were higher, the predation rates were the same between them all. Right. Yeah. Parasitism too. And we actually even collected monarch caterpillars from the field. We um, raised them in the lab to see if we'd get any emerging parasitoids. And we only found one parasitoid total over like three months worth of collecting these caterpillars. So both plots pretty much was, weren't attracting these parasitoids either. Yeah, that's, that's going to be very interesting and exciting for a lot of people I know, because like you, I hear that concern all the time, especially with monarchs and other butterflies that are of conservation concern or just the big, pretty flashy ones everybody likes to look at. Yeah, and I think the important message to people is you are going to lose some monarchs. It's going to happen. I mean, other insects have to eat too. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, you can't worry about that because according to our research, at least, it, it suggests that it's really low. Um, mo most of them do survive to adults. And 
and sometimes conditions that are not even related to parasitoids or predators as natural enemies um, aren't even the reason that these monarchs aren't making it to adults. It can be other abiotic factors. So yeah, I, I think it's just the important take home message here is you don't need to worry about wasps and bees in your, in your gardens. And yeah, I'm like you, the other critters have to eat too. And if you've got enough good habitat out there, you can have the entire ecosystem. You can have everything working together with there and have the predation, have the parasitism. And I mean, all that's going to feed other organisms higher up the food chain as well. It all kind of works together. Yeah, exactly. And many of these natural enemies are uh, pollinators as well. So mm -hmm. they're very important. You, you definitely want to leave them be. Okay. Now you also did some research on nitrogen levels as well, which I thought was interesting because many urban areas have these higher nitrogen levels, whether you're on a golf course or just in town, because people fertilize their yards like crazy in a lot of places. So you were looking at the effects of nitrogen on the milkweeds and then also on the caterpillars as well. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So we separated it into two experiments. That way we could look at the milkweed traits without monarchs feeding on them. And then we looked at milkweed with monarchs feeding on them. And like, as you said, the survival of these, these caterpillars. And um, we did a very extreme rate of nitrogen. No one would even be able to replicate this in their own home garden. And we did this rate because it was based on the golf course annual application rate of nitrogen. So at the end of the year, what, how much nitrogen they had applied over the year across an entire 12 months. We took that and we did it over about six to eight weeks. <laughs> so it's a very extreme high nitrogen rate. We were just trying to achieve this end result of this high concentration of nitrogen. So I want to make that point because you, you won't even see this, this level of nitrogen in, in gardens. <laughs> uh, you won't even see that on golf courses at one given time. It's, yeah. So yeah, we, we applied some uh, treatments with a rate of our high nitrogen, which was based on the annual rate that golf courses apply. And then we reduced that by a factor of 10 for our low nitrogen treatment. So we had some pots that were planted with this high extreme nitrogen and then others that were with a low rate, which is probably going to be more typical of what you would see in a garden, honestly. So we had that same kind of design that we had in the field, which was a monoculture versus a mixed species. And we wanted to know, okay, what happens to we, the center milkweed plant that's surrounded by other species or surrounded by the same species, how does it grow? That was our first question. That was the plant question of it. What happens just to the milkweed? Mm -hmm. uh, and we got some more surprising results with these mixed species. We found that the milkweed that was growing surrounded by other species actually, um, so our center milkweed at the end of the experiment, we counted the number of leaves, we did plant height, we, we even looked at leaf area. We wanted to know how these plants were being affected by these other species and these diff two different treatments. And found that a milkweed planted in the center of a mixed species plant, if it has high nitrogen, mm -hmm. it will be tall. If it has low nitrogen, it will be short. The same thing can be said for the monoculture planting. If it was treated with high nitrogen, this center plant will be tall, but it won't be tall if it's treated with low nitrogen. So for that result, it did not matter what species surrounded. It only mattered what nitrogen was, rate was applied. Okay. And then we did see an interaction for our uh, leaf area. So for that, a milkweed plant, in order to have larger leaves, it needed to be planted with other species and 
have a high nitrogen rate. And these were all planted in the ground too. We're not talking in pots, correct? No, they were in pots. They were in 20 gallon pots. But everything was planted in the same pot. Yeah, sorry. They, they were planted in a large pot um, and they, so they were interacting with each other. So they were all planted together. Okay. That's what I was curious about. Yes. Yes. In the soil. <laughs> okay. And yeah, that is very interesting. So then you compared that with um, monarch caterpillars on it? Yes. So we did the same experiment. We applied the high nitrogen, the low nitrogen, and then we added uh, monarch caterpillars. And we wanted to know if their survival was going to be affected by these different treatments. So do they survive better on high nitrogen do they slide, or low nitrogen? And then how, how do they survive with the mixed species versus monoculture? And is there an interaction like I discussed with the leaf size? Mm -hmm. So for those results, uh, it's also a little confusing. <laughs> So I'll try to break it down. Um, so for those results, nitrogen seemed to be the thing that mattered the most. Um, we found that more monarch caterpillars survived to adults uh, when they were fed on the high nitrogen treatment plants. They also interestingly had larger forewings. So we measured their forewing mm -hmm. length. Um, and so Regardless of male, female, all monarchs that fed on nitro high nitrogen plants, they had larger wings. Interesting. And did you look at the vitamins, nutrients, um, just chemical makeup of the leaves and how that might play a role in producing that? Like better quality diet equals better quality um, adult monarchs, I mean, sort of thing. Yes, we did find as expected, our crude protein was higher in our high nitrogen treatment than the low nitrogen. Uh, obviously our nitrogen was also higher, maybe not obviously, you never know what the plants are doing, but they did actually uptake this nitrogen and they, they did have a higher percent nitrogen in their leaves uh, in the whole plant actually, when they were in this high nitrogen treatment. Um, we actually still have not published this paper uh, because we're still waiting on the cardinalide toxin results. Okay. Um, so that's to be continued. <laughs> uh, that's delayed, unfortunately, due to the pandemic. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's going to be interesting to find out too, what that says, because if I'm remembering correctly and correct me if I'm wrong on this in general, Longer forewings, larger monarchs tend to survive migration better. Right. Yes. They should be storing more energy. Um, we don't have those results yet. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping to sometime before the end of the year, but we're still waiting on that analysis. Okay. And then also with the cardinaloids, even though that's what the monarch caterpillars are storing, that helps to give the protection both to the caterpillars and then later to the adults. If those get too high, then your survival rates go down. It's not, there's a very thin line in there. Yes. So I'm glad you brought that up because our, our species, the swamp milkweed actually typically has very low toxin levels compared to other species, especially when you compare it to the non-native tropical milkweed. That one is one of the highest toxin concentration milkweed of these cardinaloids. So if you have too high of certain nutrients, more specifically phosphorus, it appears is the association. It does increase these cardinaloid levels in the plant and becomes toxic to monarchs. Uh, however, we did not see this with our high nitrogen treatment. Our survival was obviously more, and as I said, in the high nitrogen treatments than the low nitrogen. So it appears at least for this species of milkweed, that's not affecting the, uh, this, this overdosing. Okay, because I mean, that's one thing that we always have to think about when we start tweaking 
and playing with things is how does it how does it affect the rest of the system? Because never, nothing ever works in a vacuum in nature. And I mean, that's true for changing the colors of the leaves and a plant with a cultivar or the flower petal colors or whatever. Those colors are coming from certain chemicals in the plant. So if we're changing it, then how does that affect whatever's eating the plant? Or in this case, if we're adding extra protein through the extra nitrogen, then how is that potentially affecting other, other processes along the way? Yes, yeah, it, it, there's so many other factors to think about. Um, you, you can even, some people bring up the aphids even feeding on these and how does that increase aphids feeding? The, yeah, you can go into so <laughs> many directions and us tweaking things, it, it, it does change things. And, and our take home message isn't put more nitrogen on your, milkweed, it's more so if we planted this on a golf course, it's not going to kill monarchs. Mm -hmm. uh, that was our concern. We didn't want to add milkweed conservation habitat to golf courses and have nothing survive on these milkweeds. Right. You don't want to create, it's better to have nothing than to attract them to something that's going to kill them. <laughs> exactly. Right. And normally when I'm working with native plants and garden settings and stuff, especially larger areas. But I don't recommend fertilizing those plants because if they're native to your area, they're going to be adapted to your soils. They're going to be able to handle whatever low nutrients might be in there or higher nutrients. So when we go in and fertilizing things, a lot of times we tend to increase the weed species that we don't want because they're not adapted to the soil. Yes. Yeah. And it, it it's, just important to know that if you do fertilize your garden and most people have lawns planted next to you, mm -hmm. their, uh, their gardens, if you're fertilizing your lawn and there's going to be runoff from the lawn and it, if it gets in your garden, the, the message is here. You don't need to worry about the monarchs. At least they they'll be fine. They'll still survive. Right. They, you might get, healthier looking plants. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Or as people who are in town are starting to plant that sidewalk strip, this is strip between the road and the sidewalk with native plants. I hear a lot more people doing it. Well, again, you could have runoff from the neighbor's yards, even if it's not from your own yard on the fertilizer. So it's, it's nice knowing that that's not necessarily a big deal. Yes, exactly. And uh, I think it would be interesting to see what the other species are doing and how there's so many questions I have, like how much of this is running off, how much is it being uptaken, you know, mm -hmm. and the species we selected, they prefer wet soils. They're not aquatic, but they're more wetland riparian zone type species. So they might be better at uptaking nutrients because typically wetland species are, mm -hmm. they're used as a filtration system. So, so many questions I had from this, but we did not dive into that. It was only a master's. <laughs> yes, that's for other people to keep going on. Exactly. But, but yeah, and the fact that they were wetland species is really good to know as well, because one of the issues with runoff is getting into these wetland aquatic systems. And so if they can uptake it better and help to keep it from getting into the waterway as much. That's also helpful as well. Yes. Now you are in Florida and sometimes location matters a lot in ecological. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> location really matters a lot in a lot of ecological studies, but then there's other things that can be more generalized across a wider range. Is there anything that you can think of that would suggest that your research is more Florida centric or should probably maybe be mostly the same, like all those qualifiers in there for the, it depends part, um, <laughs> should mostly sort of be the same for other parts of the Eastern US as well. Can they more or less be generalized? Yes, so these species were not just native to Florida, the, the species we selected, they're native to most of the US or the, at least the Southeast. I think we can generalize it more to the Southeast. You also have to consider Florida's environment is more humid, it's more hot. 
and some monarchs do fall out of migration in Florida. Um, so we may have had more monarchs in our plots year round than you would see somewhere else. Maybe the Midwest, for example, it might look different. But for the Southeast, it should be a pretty, pretty good. Um, pretty good generalization. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, and I mean, I'm sure Florida has a whole lot more monarchs than like we do up here where I'm at in Kentucky or in other areas, especially like if you start going more east, because I mean, yes, there's monarchs in Virginia and North Carolina and stuff, but they're getting further out there on those edges of the migration route and where you see them. Yes. And, and this was done in North Central Florida. So we do still see a lot of the migrating monarchs. If we had done this in Miami, for example, it would have been very different because those monarchs are residential monarchs. They do not migrate. Um, so there would be differences there. So you can't generalize this for all of Florida necessarily. I mean, you can, but you're going to get a little bit different results depending on where you get it. But I think we generalized it for the Southeast because of the species that we selected. Swamp milkweed is found, I believe, in the entire United States. Native, but yes, all of these species can be grown in other parts of the U.S. So are there key takeaways that we haven't talked about that we should bring up for our homeowners who are listening? Yes, the key takeaways are that diversity does matter. It matters not just for increasing your monarchs, but it also matters for other insects, other arthropods. If you increase your wildflower diversity, you're going to see an increase in your insect diversity. Um, so that is a huge take home message. The more species in your garden, the better. And I think honestly, most gardeners do have a diverse mixture. I've actually probably never seen a garden with only milkweed, maybe only grass, but that's a whole different. <laughs> that's a whole, that's not a garden. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's just a lawn. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, so, so you don't need to worry about if you only have, you know, five milkweed plants and you can't fit more, you, you, you are still making an impact by having these other species planted with both monarchs and other insects. And if you happen to be living next to a golf course that has high nitrogen applied and there's potential runoff, you don't need to worry about your monarchs feeding on swamp milkweed specifically being uh, harmed by this. They'll typically, from our results, they may do better, they may have higher survival if there is high nitrogen around. But again, I wanna stress, this is swamp milkweed, Thuthius incarnata specifically. I cannot say the same if you're planting tropical milkweed or a different, especially if you're planting a species with higher cardinaloid toxins. Yes, that's definitely something that we want to stress is that this is for swamp milkweed, rose milkweed, Asclepius incarnata, not with any of the other milkweed species that are out there. And there are a ton of other milkweed species out there. I mean, even the other natives, we don't know if the same results would be true because you haven't tested them on there. That's for somebody else. Exactly. And, and there have been, there are some studies with uh, phosphorus and um, it showed that Swamp milkweed even isn't effective when there's high phosphorus with these increased toxins. Um, however, tropical milkweed is, and um, that's where you see the overdosing, essentially um, higher mortality when there's higher phosphorus with tropical milkweed. And I'm not remembering, it was another native species I'm not remembering at the moment, so I don't want to be <laughs> misquoted on that, but there are other native sp species where you could see a, a negative result, essentially, something you wouldn't want, yeah. Again, it goes back to that playing with the system too much, and we don't know what all the consequences are always with it. Exactly. So were there other surprising discoveries that you make? Because you, you, it sounds like you had several in there. Yeah, it, it was just, it was really interesting project. It was a really fun project. <laughs> um, it, it's just, it was so great to be out there and doing what I love for a master's project. And I was just surprised 
I was hopeful when I when we came up with this, this experiment that the mixed species plots would do as well as they did, um, but I was surprised by it just because of previous research anything that most things on herbivore research it it kind of stresses that you need more milkweed or, or even um, guidelines for planting a monarch conservation habitat they stress that you need to have the milkweed. And, and yes, that's important, but other things are important. And um, those are things we just, we need to think about. And I was also shocked by the result that we saw more natural enemies and had the same survival of monarchs in our plots and the mixed versus monoculture. That was, that was huge to me because I love insects. And so for me to be able to plant milkweed with other species in my garden and have two for one, that's great. Yes, exactly. I am the same way completely with it. So yeah, that that's really exciting. But so yeah, thanks. This has been really educational. And for our listeners, I will have links in the show notes for Rebecca's thesis, as well as the articles that have been published about it for resources for those who want to dig in and learn more. Are there other resources that you would recommend? Yes, uh, especially here in Florida. I, I, if you're doing any Florida gardening or Florida things in general, the, the University of Florida has an amazing extension office with uh, in each county basically of Florida. So you can even dive into the county level you can Google UF extension and find gardening solutions, gardening ideas. Uh, you can find more on monarch conservation and, and other research that's going on um, that's very geared towards the general public. So it's a great resource. And other states have extension offices as well. Yes, I was going to say, I think every state has an extension office, usually a bi-county level. But I mean, I think there's a couple of areas where they're have combined counties, but mostly of a county by county level. And the extension offices are wonderful for finding out information. They really are. Yes. Yes. But yeah, thanks again and have a great day. Yeah. And thank you again for having me. This, this was a great conversation. I loved it. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. I appreciate Rebecca talking with us today. I'm glad more people are starting to conduct scientific research on gardening for monarchs, other pollinators, and wildlife in urban areas, suburban areas, and even around homes in more rural settings. For me, there are two key takeaways from Rebecca's research. First, even though we may find more natural predators and parasitoids in gardens that contain lots of different types of plants, that doesn't seem to really impact the survival of monarch caterpillars. Rebecca really didn't see any difference in the number of caterpillars that survived in mixed species plots than in milkweed only plots, despite the mixed species plots having more natural enemies, as she called them. The other key takeaway for me was that you don't have to worry too much if you have swamp milkweeds growing in areas where there is the potential for high levels of nitrogen runoff. Those high levels of nitrogen probably aren't creating much if any additional risk to monarch caterpillars feeding on those plants. Now, please don't misunderstand this. As Rebecca said, this doesn't mean that we should go out and over fertilize all of our milkweeds. That is absolutely not what this research is showing. It's simply saying that we don't have to freak out when these situations happen. It's also important to remember that this study was conducted with swamp milkweed or Asclepias incarnata. Different species of milkweeds may respond differently to increased nitrogen, and this may have different impacts on the insects that feed on those plants. Before I wrap this up, I wanted to let you know about my email list. Every week, I send a short email with links to the most recent Backyard Ecology blog article and podcast episode, as well as any other news of interest. It's the best way to make sure that you never miss anything in the backyard ecology world. If you haven't signed up, then I encourage you to do so at www.backyardecology.net slash subscribe. Until next week, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yard and community.